my pleasure and honor today to be here with a very distinguished panel um, to talk about a, a topic that is certainly important to uh, and very dear to all of our hearts. It's my pleasure to introduce His Highness Igwe of Onitsha, Igwe of Yuro Onitsha rather, um, here. I could spend five, 15 minutes, two days describing his accomplishments and contributions to life and to Nigerian and African society. He's asked me to keep it short. Um, so I will introduce him um, as His Royal Highness, um, a culture a cultured flag bearer, not just for Igbo land, but actually Nigeria, Africa, and the continent, a continent businessman, um, an ambassador in, in, a, in a number of, in an informal way. Uh, I'm going to leave it there in your royal hands. Um, Dr. Beji Maiwala, um, Head of Creative Arts for the University of Lagos. Again, somebody else who, uh, and, and through her talk and stories, we'll hear a lot more about why she is so involved in this and why she's so relevant to this particular discussion. Um, but a highly accomplished and committed uh, culture and flag bearer, especially for the arts. Fabian Ajogu, um, Professor Fabian Ajogu Sang, um, a lawyer by day and an art supporter and flag bearer by night. I, I stress the fact that all of us here, and, 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 and last but not least, uh, my name is Yvonne Fasero. Again, I'm a banker by day, and uh, I, I, I hope, well, I, I, I thought I was a culture bearer by night until I started reading some of the things that were missing in, our, in, in promoting our arts, and, and you know, I, I think I need to uh, do a bit more. We'll talk about that. So, um, a, a, a culture and art bearer by, um, uh, as a second thing. Um, the point I want to make before we go into the conversation is that everyone here is very accomplished, very busy, but has these topics very close to their minds, and we collectively as a body, together with artists, are determined, and many people in this room, you might be looking at, and I'll do a few call-outs later, um, are determined that where we are today, um, and I'll come back to that, is just not good enough, and what we want to have a conversation in this room is about where are we? Where as a group do we want to go? And how do we think we can get there? And what are some of the important initiatives that have happened or not happened in recent times? We're going to frame the conversation around this particular um, footage, this, this video that was done in 1953. Um, it's called Statues Also Die. And the, the point of and, and I stress the time of 1952, because as Mr. said, it's absolutely relevant to today's, um, to today's conversation. It was done by a Frenchman and an Englishman. And what they tried to do at the time was to challenge the, the way that colonials had handled our art. In researching for this particular talk, what we actually realized is very little has changed. Um, and we're going to have a conversation about uh, about that today. So now I'm going to talk very quickly about where we are in, 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 our, collect, uh, in our collections today. So we have less than 20 museums across Nigeria. Just to put that into context, um, in the United Kingdom there are 16,000 museums, and in the United States of America there are 35,000 museums. Um, the museums that we do have, um, the museums that we do have are in the poor states, most of them were built in the mid 50 in the 50s. Um, the collections are dwindling. Uh, the, the, the works are not properly documented, and also we have uh, and the state of the collections is actually something um, that we should all challenge ourselves with. Uh, I bring this up as the first image. So this picture of Queen Elizabeth II of England, which was done in 1956. Um, by one of the most important art masters of all time. He happens to be a Nigerian, Ben Moore. Um, this sculpture was done and it's sitting in our National Museum in Oniko. I've been there several times, I've never seen it. Um, it's stored badly. Um, we have uh, the Prince of Wales visiting Nigeria next week. So there was an initiative to bring it out and put it in the British Embassy uh, for him to come. Apart from the fact that it was stored badly, 
This is it as on the floor, right by the truck, before it's loaded onto the truck. I have another image, but I'll stick with this one, of a, um, pieces of carton paper at the bottom of it to carry something that um, even the finest auctioneers or valuers of us could not possibly price. Um, so this is this is where we are. This is our state. Uh, this is our state of play today. Just another very quick um, uh, initiative or example of some of the things. So let me talk about. I'll keep this picture here. So, so a lot of us in this room are collectors, including myself, and we collect art, and we uh, very often do it mainly for. Uh, to participate in, 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 uh, in collecting art, to uh, support our culture, and also, importantly for a lot of us, it's about um, investment and making money. But what really is a collector? So I asked a few people, and here's what somebody said. There can be no collecting if there's no love, no space for reaction, no room for feeling, and amongst the people who exalt transaction over experience. Another person said, there's a fundamental existential disconnect which must be addressed. A reconnection to self, to the cultural elements of self, to the conventions of beauty and representation, to education and self-development. And maybe then, the hearts of the elite, the minds of the elite, and their knowledge and understanding of philosophy will expand and further direct the resources to go beyond acquiring art, but beyond that, respect art, Succumb to art, exalt art, obey art, experience the power of art, protect and develop art. The collector collects himself, his past, his future, and his humanity, and he does that. He does this for love and posterity. So I'm going to stop there and say, all of us as a body of people, as Nigerians, as human beings, should be challenging ourselves. And the reason I say a body of people, we have a lot of people who are African and Nigerian by heart, like Jess Costello, for example, who has pushed the boundaries exponentially in terms of collecting and documenting art. Um, and we need to look at what we, and some of the initiatives that we can do. So for example, last year, just bearing this in mind, last year we, we uh, myself and one other Nigerian, Aiguji Mokede, who's not here today, um, we heard about the Tate, and this new commentary was another person who came in and said, the Tate has been looking at Benny Wongu, um, and people like Kabita Chalons know they've been looking at Benny Wongu, they've been wanting to collect his pieces, but we don't even have enough. There's no Benny Wongu piece in the Tate. Um, it's, it's, he has, there are pieces, his pieces outside in, in the Western world, but it's, it's not well documented. So we came together and did a symposium, which Chika was part of, uh, the Chika monitored the early panel, to talk about positioning Nigerian modernism <coughs> as a celebration for Ben Wong, um, his hundred years, had he been alive, he would have been hundred years last year. So there's some simple things that we can all do um, to move this along. I'm going to, um, just by way of discussion, what we're going to do now is just see some of the slides that inspired this, this um, presentation. This, um, it doesn't seem like it's working, so we'll move on swiftly. I'm going to move on to Dr. Raiwala to focus really on the historical importance of collecting arts and institutionalizing collecting arts. Um, she has a conversation to have with us. I'm going to have the microphone later. Thank you very much. Uh, the fact that painting a very dismal picture by showing us the work of uh, Ben Wong, the sculpture of Ben Wong. And then I'm asking myself, what is the essence of my project in Benin? Uh, I'll start by saying that um, I didn't grow up in Lagos, I think I should have it. But my father is from Lagos State, from the Saliku. Uh, when I grew up in Benin, uh, my father, about to do a room, uh, married to Elizabeth Ubu, me and Kenzo. Total of the Kenzo the second. Uh, so you can imagine that um, as a young girl growing up in the city of the name, I was influenced and uh, inspired by the carvers and the broadcasters along the Beeway, Eco Street, uh, Airport Road. So I also had a lot of stories being told by my mother. And I didn't think that I would walk in the area of um, contested patrimony, uh, stolen works, looted works from the name. 
and it was more inspired by the very positive stories uh, that they did offer. Uh, and uh, I started thinking about um, adding a voice to this vexed issue of uh, contested patrimony uh, when I was invited by a French anthropologist uh, from uh, uh, Bernard Mouly uh, on his project uh, titled Broken Memories. And he was looking at how expropriated art, what impact it had on the community from where they had been violently removed. And I did some research with uh, the bronze casters of Benin, and they told me that they would like to connect with the work that were done by the predecessors. And what they did was to look through catalogs and uh, books uh, produced by uh, most of the museums that are holding uh, objects. And so that was the kind of thing that they had that they were disconnected from those works. Okay, then uh, in 2006, I was invited to uh, write a catalog for, write a, an article for the catalog uh, on Benin, the Benin Kings and Rituals Exhibition I held in Vienna, travels to uh, Benin, Paris, and then close to Chicago. And I saw the exhibition in Vienna and also in Chicago. In fact, I had the honor of giving the lecture that ended this two uh, year long exhibition. Uh, and I, and this exhibition was uh, showed uh, 300 books from different museums uh, in Europe and America. So I came back thinking about what I could do to add my voice to this uh, debate. So I had this project, uh, my first solo exhibition in Nigeria, which was tied to Benin in 1997.com. Of course, Benin, the uh, venue of the expedition to Benin, uh, the uh, 1897 date, and dot .com, like the internet domain name dot .commercial. And dot commercial will imply that uh, Benin objects were commodified. Objects that were sold to offset the cost of the expedition uh, for a pound or two pounds at the close of the 19th century uh, will now you know, attract very high prices on the international market. Uh, in 2010, one of the pendant masks appeared in Sotheby and uh, it was being offered for between 3.5 million pounds to 4.5 million pounds. And it had to be pulled down from auction because it was on the journal tested. So I began to look at this. Um, uh, theme in 1997. And it, I would say that it wasn't the first project. Um, I, there have been several other projects before my own time. Um, 1966, playwright uh, Gary Kiyemi did a play uh, in 1974, Ahmed Yerima. 1997, um, sorry, 19, 1974 was Olaru to me. 1997 was uh, Ahmed Yerima who did a play to mark the centenary centenary of uh, the expedition to the name. And of course, uh, we have played uh, films like uh, Invasion of the 27 by Lancelot and Lancelot, um, the Leo Asenota, a, a London-based uh, dual artist, did a very extensive project uh, looking at the uh, British history and the history, and did the end uh, project. And then my work began to inspire other artists. In fact, uh, Jemila Atiku, and um, just uh, footages from my installation went open in Ibadan and uh, produced that for his own uh, uh, performance, which he titled A Lost in Sports. Now, I decided to have this exhibition within the academy in Lagos and Ibadan. It is a university uh, museum. I couldn't afford to pay for the very expensive galleries in Lagos. Anyway, so, but I was also very interested in having people to talk about it, to discuss it, scholarly debates about this issue. And from the very time that we hung out the banner, the, the discussions were ongoing. I also thought that in terms of documentation, it was important that we're dealing with uh, some collection, collections in different parts of the world that belong to one culture. And it was important that we would also get the voices of uh, African scholars. And so the uh, brochure which came out of this exhibition uh, has uh, entries from uh, African scholars. In the, in the text, as part of the text. So one of the installations that I did, and we, we know that the Benin objects were quite a number that were looted, between 2,000, 2,500 and 4,000 words. And I decided to do an installation which uh, captured that in a way that was quite different from just creating 4,000 words. I did a thousand terracotta heads, as you find on the screen, and um, that was more than enough to cover more than half of the gallery space. And I did it with less inferior material. Most of the ones that were stolen were bronze ones. Uh, what I did was to work in metaphor uh, on, on the surface of the terracotta work. And these are the images of, I mean, you must have seen these images before, of the soldiers when they looted and they packed the walls and thought in the courtyard uh, on the way to, to, to the UK. 
And the king of the name, His Royal Majesty of Arijawa, wrote uh, the foreword to my catalog. He also wrote the foreword to the uh, Bishop of Vienna, and he asked that the people of Austria, where the works were being shown, will show magnanimity and return some of the objects to the So that's the state we are, that we are now at, where, where the works of the name are uh, being uh, going to be returned. We'll come to that point later. But the other words that I did, I can't show, say, talk about all of that because of time that I have, but to say that uh, quite a number of other works that have been archived, uh, it was a way of bringing together communal history, local history, international history, and also personal history. Um, some of the works that I did, very similar in terms of the meaning to Yinka Shonebari's work, um, Scram for Africa, it was checked out history, and I looked at some of the plants that we find in the British Museum took some of the textures and created a checker pattern. So Africa became like um, a draft board, a playground for colonial parts. Um, another slide will show some of the other works that I did, um, showing the works as they connected with the history, not just the ancient history, but also the contemporary history of, of the name. In one of the works I did was titled Awaga Tokwe, um, which is on the screen now, I looked at the looked at gods, uh, color batches and usually receptacles for keeping sacrificial material. And if you go to the name, at crossroads you will find pots of sacrifices. And we used to share jokes as young children that uh, we take the coins from the pots and spend them buying ice cream at school. But those sacrifices were made for the gods, but we never got uh, you know injured by that activity. But I thought I could use this very ephemeral material to as a means of um, you know, commemorating the king, very different from the bronze heads that we found on the shrines that were desecrated by the British. And then again, another work that talks about the uh, diaries, the entry that I made by the British soldiers that made their way through the creeks to the name. Now, that was a project that I did, it was a solo exhibition, but subsequently I began to think about the name in a different light. In 2014, another project which I did. But I thought I should vex this project by inviting all the artists to take part. And we brought quite a number of artists together, uh, artists who are poets, performance artists, video artists, photographers, to um, look at the, the history, national history, how Nigeria was amalgamated, the southern and northern projector, and we kind of ask questions of artists. What, uh, whose whose centenary is it? Is it our centenary? Or the centenary of the British who put together these two uh, areas, two, these two uh, regions? Uh, for administrative convenience. So we thought that we should go back to Benin. And indeed, 2014 was the centenary year of the passing of Oba Oberami, who stood against British imperialism. So we thought that we should go to Benin and celebrate arts and culture. So we had quite a number of interventions. For me, this was important because Benin art is always about celebrating um, the royalty. But I thought that we should go activate a historical site, which was which is the Queen in Go Street, where the uh, broadcasters actually live and work. And so we went into that space, the historical site, and did our interventions there. And we got the broadcasters involved in this project. For me, this was another way of um, saying that, yes, this is a contemporary building. Let us have the involvement of people. We used the rustic space to show our works. And we had a great interaction, we had great interaction from people in the community. And that is uh, Victor Eke, and we're not doing some of his uh, site specialist uh, paintings in the home of the head of the Guild of Casters. And um, another one which shows my installation, which I did in 2010, uh, was mounted on the corridor of the uh, Guild of Casters. And that work, I invited the bronze casters to bring in the bronze uh, sculptures into this installation. And in this way, a lot of uh, boundaries were broken. The artists were now working. Uh, with academically trained artists, and we had new um, you know, uh, works that we made from this uh, experiment. So the slide here shows 2014, the return of two million objects, the Bloodbed of Prophecy and the Gong by Adrian Walker, who is the grandson of um, Captain Walker, who was inspired by the extraordinary uh, forces that came to Benin. And he, he, he said that he had always coveted these two objects in his grandfather's cupboard. And that when he finally inherited them, he felt that if he loved them so much, he wondered how those who actually want these works would feel. And he decided in 2014 to bring the works back to the palace where his grandfather had been and 
I told them to the king. So perhaps when we take questions or when we come back to me, I'll go further to the school. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Dr. Laila. Thank you very much for the um, discussion. A couple of things. When, we, when you and I were discussing earlier, you said museums, do we really need museums? Can we talk a bit about that? Why, why are you challenging the concept of museums as, as an important or, or, or a main means of institutionalizing collections? Well, I would say that it's very important that we keep our collections. Um, what I'm most questioning the format in which the museums appear to be. And you wonder sometimes why we don't have a lot of visitors going to museums because some of these these objects that we display are put behind show glasses. We're not actually meant to be kept in that way. So we must think about more creative ways of engaging the public in appreciating these works of art. And I think that the um, work that we did, the project we did in Benin, what actually took us to a historical site was another way of rethinking those spaces, those spaces that are not, uh, nece that are not necessary in museums, but they are museums in their own right, because there are shrines there where the works are kept, there's, 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 there are ateliers, there are places, spaces where people have been for several centuries. Uh, this, are, this is an exact street where the descendants of the Bloodscaffers who made the works who are, that are located in these museums actually live and work. So I think that uh, we must think about how we can involve the community uh, how we can you know, commit, involve them in viewing these works and appreciating them, not in the very set ways in which we have the museums uh, in Nigeria today. I think we have to rethink the entire concept of the museum and see how we can have more public engagement with the, with the collection. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to go to Dr. Uh, His Highness, Dr. Um, and I'm going to start with the end of the video, statues also die. Because you have sadly taken a leadership role in, in, in addressing the issue that we have. At the end, in the last few minutes of this presentation, which unfortunately we can't hear, said, because there's no rupture between African civilization and ours, the faces of black art fell off <coughs> from the same human face, like the serpent's skin. Beyond their dead form, they recognized this promise common to all great cultures, of a man who is victorious over the world, and white or black, our future is made of this promise. And I'm going to hand over to you now to talk a bit more about why you, you have devoted so much of your life and energy to promoting our culture for social, economic, and arts transformation, and cultural transformation. I just listen to be to uh, explain uh, why we have to find new ways to uh, engage uh, the community um, in appreciating art and uh, going to the uh, um, museum or wherever. I think that's uh, that's a really challenge. I think that's what we're thinking about and what we're trying to do as a mission. If I back off uh, a little bit in terms of how I got into, into that, um, well, I started collecting art uh, before I became, uh, uh, before I took this uniform. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, many aesthetics, and uh, as usual in everything in life, you meet a friend who introduces you to, to it, and then um, you pick up uh, the pleasure. I remember myself and the uh, uh, recent family from Paris, uh, in the summertime, uh, walking up and down Bayswater Road. The art fair on Sundays and so on. But then, um, uh, becoming the pure furniture, uh, I think, transformed my whole commitment and my whole form because, uh, um, as a traditional leader, as a pure furniture, I'm the custodian of the culture of my people in every aspect. Um, and uh, our traditional arts is. Uh, Unlike many other places where it's respected, it's sculptures and, uh, and uh, other uh, visual forms. Ours is the combination of the creative art, the dance, the music, and, uh, and everything. Uh, very much reflected, say, in the paintings of Ben and Wong, the old paintings, the whole of the masquerades, all that. 
uh, the performance, the music, and the, the visual all come together uh, to, to make up. So, um, getting to a picture uh, when I did uh, my board and uh, found, or I found the need basically to move the community to the 21st century. So, we have a massive transformation program that uh, we kicked off a few years ago. We did studies on the economics, on the development, women, um, uh, and also our culture. Uh, the, not static and to stay in, in line with, uh, I think, in the process. Uh, I, my own personal uh, zeal and my own passion of uh, visual art well, became part of that transformation. And then um, coming to a decision to build a museum ultimately came out of a conversation with uh, Omoba Denise Shiloh. I spent a day with him in his house. I asked him, what are you going to do with all this? Uh, uh, everything around it. So he didn't know. I said, what to think about it? Because I have a less, uh, far, modern, far much more modest collection. But I'm thinking about what will happen as I'm gone. And then, of course, uh, we had the option some have sold off their collection, others parcel them out and donate to institutions and so on. But I thought the best thing was to build a museum. One, it takes a life of its own and it can grow beyond whatever you left there. Can part of the community <coughs> can be useful for basically transforming the community socially otherwise. And if you look at where uh, you know, the, the first the first build map with, with uh, the map of Nigeria or part of Nigeria was on issue there, if you look in any direction, I think the nearest that is in Israel is in Benin. So you know we're there in that process, you know, uh, without uh, so Nietzsche can attract it to me. It's my home. And if we do something there, we could use it to basically not just transform our nature, but in the bigger area and get people more interested in, uh, in the uh, visual art. So that's basically the drive. And education, uh, uh, enjoyment, etc. In the process of developing, we're constructing now, I wish you see a picture where we are in the construction phase. But Yesterday, I was in Lagos on Friday. I had to rush back to Amisha yesterday. We had a meeting with uh, one of our young men who was doing very well. Uh, Sultan Zebi, who is the curator of the African collection of the Greenland Museum. I wanted to come and spend the day with him and give us some input in terms of how we're going and what we need to do. And uh, ultimately, when the museum is ready, one of our facilities, well, the gallery should be there, but it will be a library, a e library, with a lot of historical material on each other, which we are lucky that one of our, one of the American uh, scholars collected fantastic materials on each other, um, and he's donated everything to us. We digitizing them at the University of Arizona, um, e library, to bring all of that back. But we'll have uh, the grounds, we we'll have cuisines, uh, traditional cuisine that we can come and eat, relax, and uh, uh, have a drink. We'll have programs for the children, but dance, uh, you know, bringing dance and literature and everything together just to respond to the kind of challenges that we do as seen. So that's where I started, and that's where we are. And this is, uh, well, the previous picture was the model. If you go back one step, Theo, you stand up. Mm -hmm. As architect, we are together yesterday. together here So I got the land uh, from the government. Um, I have to be very, very stealth about it because it's a very, very choice piece of land in the GRP, just about the last piece of land that was available. And uh, P2B was the government. If I asked him for it earlier on, you'll find the reason why I wouldn't get it because the government will have the land for some other purpose. So I waited until the last days of his administration. He <laughs> was in a hurry to get out, and I, kept, I got him to sign up for it. And in the first days of uh, the Bianca's administration, I called him to issue the CFO. And after that, his commission actually began to say, that piece of land, why is it a museum? It's a government land, it's an adjunct of the, of, the, um, 
of the stadium, it was next door to the stadium. So I quickly found some money. I basically went to my savings and found money. And we did the foundation. If you go back one step, we did the slab, we did the foundation. I got to go there to make the foundation stop. There's no way you can take it back from us. We've gone beyond that, and the, uh, the, this is where we're at now. It's very, it's very important. The next stage is to put a roof on top of it and then begin to finish, in, finish the West Wing and get into business and then. But the palace is another challenge you have. And um, when I came in, what you see now is just a small bungalow, a room that is not much bigger than this space, about, about one and a half times the size of this space. And we've transformed it into what it is here today. With um, the traditional chambers at the back, this is the, uh, this is the approach road from the main road. We've just done the walls with tra our traditional motif. There's 30 panels done by Imad Banefu, who is well known um, over there. And we're now transforming the inside of the palace. <laughs> all the chambers are being transformed. This is one of the very central chambers. Uh, work is still going on. We're about to start um, last month to have the final festival and they resume work and so on. So at the end of the day, the palace itself will become you know, what the palace used to be. Um, an artistic uh, center itself. The grounds have statues of all my predecessors and uh, so on and so forth. So that's where we are. And um, if you are at this point, then the will to conversation. I will, I'll ask you one more question yes. before you move on. So in, in statues also die. Um, I'm going to take this go over one minute. The accompanying voice of the narration sets out and then challenges a series of colonialist assumptions widely held in Western Europe, Europe at that time about the African continent and Africa, African people, ranging from perceptions of Africa as a land of enigmas, thematic references to blackness as a, sin, a color of sin, and questions about how the complexity of black arts might be differently perceived and contemplated by con contemporary African descended audiences as opposed to prevailing white European museum going publics. So my question to you is, why is it important for us to own our own narrative? Well, if you don't own your own narrative... What should we do about it? Um, what we should do about it is uh, basically uh, uh, we listen to Yuka uh, uh, just about an hour ago and uh, the, the, the drive, uh, the initiative he's taken to be himself, to be a Nigeria in the global world and to, to speak to himself and the language he understands. And then um, um, collectors, uh, it's the same. Um, I collect now literally Nigerian, Ghanaian, and other African art. Okay, and they make more meaning to me. Um, I engage with the artists. Literally every collector I have that I uh, have his work, I make an effort to visit him, spend time with him in the studio, uh, chat with him, see. Uh, what drives it and sometimes also influence uh, the way they're going about it. So, um, if you don't have your narrative, somebody else will take care of I think that's. Uh, <laughs> Parts of the world, 
no more than 20% of the funding to support arts and culture is actually done by the government. The rest of it is done by corporates, by private foundations and individuals. And in our case, we have the benefit of our traditional rulers, like the Obi um, and several others, who, uh, uh, several other, other of our traditional leaders who can help with this institutionalized, institutionalized, institutionalized <laughs> but the important thing is, okay, so thank you. Legally, what do we need to think about? Thank you very much, uh, Yvonne. My brief point of departure is to pay my respect to His Royal Majesty, the Bureau of Bonita, and LD States, uh, Dr. Christopher Kaladi, Mrs. Kaladi. It puts me in the right frame of mind to then talk about the point made earlier on by Agogili about if you don't tell your story, someone else will tell it for you. There's a reason why you still have period poems uh, all over England. It speaks to their history. The Roman architecture is part of them. Uh, there's a reason not to rename all the streets in Ikui, because that's our history and it tells uh, a bit about us. But the theme essay, um, Statues, um, also die, speaks to two things, and I'd like to take them uh, together. One is about creating um, institutions to not change the real meaning of your art to fit a new stage. Uh, beyond just preserving the physical art, is that the narrative remains where it started from. Um, you see, what you have, um, on, on Friday night, the only affair talked about um, art representing the culture of the people, the stage of their civilization, conversations between people. When you look at what was obtainable in a polygamous, polytheistic, and collectivist society as we had in traditional Africa, you would realize that there is no way that you will get the same thing in a monotheistic, uh, individualistic, and monogamous system as you have um, in the European model. So trying to cross over art, for some artists who are not attentive to that, begins to distort what is referred to as black art. And that is really our culture and our background, so it ought to be preserved. Now the issue of, of the legal aspects, there is so much. I will tell you someone who sold um, a piece of Ben and Wong, um, from his father's collection. Their father was passionate, collected art. But then on passing away, the children sought to declutter the house. And they sold this piece for about 150,000. The purchaser came back a year after to give him another 200,000 telling him he was paying extra to smoothen his conscience <laughs> because he knew the value of what was sold. Now, when you ask the stories, there are lots of these stories about collectors who never realize that it is three scores and ten or even six scores. But ultimately, what happens to your collection? What happens to it as part of your estate? Taxes. How do you pass it on? How do you preserve it? As to the rights of an artist, I can ask a question. If I purchase the tutu that was downstairs, it's now mine. And next Friday, I light it up. Is this something I can do? Can I burn it? Um, it shows that I cannot burn it because I do not have exclusive rights. In Nigeria, we need to pay a little bit more attention to the rights of the artist the moral rights of the artist. Um, to object from it's being distorted, um, it's being changed, and we're talking about the obvious things of copyright, that is very obvious. What about um, people mutating ideas, or original ideas of the artist, reproducing the work, selling them? What happens to moral rights of the artist? We need to begin to look at documenting art and artwork and the sale of it. People rarely sell art with any bill of sale. They just deliver it and take cash and move on. 
and there is no history or track about it. And what then happens is that the career development of the artist is somewhat limited or stunted because there is no proper documentation of the trajectory of, of the art, um, its progress in the art. So now, in looking at all of this, you could look at the rights of the artist, collector, preserving art, estate issues to do with the art. But if we look at creating institutions out of it, it leads me to share a story one Saturday morning with Driven, uh, Professor Wanda, who you know, was the Vice Chancellor of Pan Atlantic University, and I drove to this wonderful um, human being, uh, Prince Yanusi Shiro. Apart from being a lawyer, engineer, stockbroker, how many people have read all those professions? He's all of it. He read everything in the university. He keeps adding one more profession. But he's got 7,000 pieces of artwork. I mean, 2,500 was cut out of the Kingdom. He has 7,000. He has 55,000 photographic works. And so, seeing as he was a money well invested over local art and Akara. That's all he offered us, and it was pleasant. But from that discussion, we agreed that we will set up to preserve all that he has collected, the um, Yemisi Shilon uh, Museum of Art at the Pan-Atlantic University. Behold, that is it. It was initially... It was initially an idea, and I'll just give you some, some dimensions to this. So we signed an agreement, if you can see the next screen. Um, so, so that's it. Uh, that's Mr. Pascal Dozier was the, was the pro-chancellor of the university. So we signed this unique agreement um, where he was going to endow artwork nearly 2 billion naira. It was going to put $1.5 million towards maintaining it because the point you got made in the beginning about transporting that and one was carving a uh, sculpture for the queen it was roughly handled. People then need to know about handling art, preserving it from the elements, from chemical corrosion, so many things. So he was going to put down $1.5 million to maintain it. We had to deal with issues of insurance in the agreement. But it might interest you to know that this agreement was so well structured that his family was in support but would not be able to alter it. His foundation retained ownership in perpetuity, would forever be his. He's immortalized himself and his collections. But then the university holds a lease of it in perpetuity and will manage it with the board of trustees, my co-author and renowned art author Jess Castillote will be the director of the center for, for that museum. And he has a board of trustees. So it's proper governance. Because we're talking about things that will outlast uh, all of us here. But Sheila didn't stop at that. But I told you about the thousands, tens of thousands of, yeah, by the way, that is it in reality now. That's been construct constructed already. So that's it as at, uh, a few months ago, and it keeps getting better. You'll notice that a stained building is also part of the art. This is not a color you get normally, um, but I invite you to, to visit it, um, even at this stage or later on, and you will see um, the tremendous works uh, that, is, that is already going there. But the, the point to round off with is that you have somebody who has taken steps to sort out his art collection in his lifetime. He's partnered with an institution. He's created a governance model to deal with it um, so that we're not talking about dissipating it. No one can sell any of those pieces, by the way. They can be rented out, leased out for exhibitions. But beyond that, the thousands of photographs that he's done are meant to assist us with the virtual museum so we're not just talking about museum in the way it's not at a one in Unicom, but a very high-tech one people can have access and get a virtual tour 
of it and hopefully um, get some more people to know about uh, African art. Why is this important? A lot of African Americans will tell you that it is important to them to be able to point and say, this is my root. Because it gives someone confidence to know that I have a history, I have a culture, I'm coming from somewhere. And these things are not just embedded in textbooks, they're embedded in the art. And that is why what Artex does for us is bigger than just a gathering of people, but to actually begin this process of creating institutions that would ask, leave us in the art. Thank you.
say that um, yes, uh, the future is very bright. We are, we are far behind in terms of statistics. But I'll say, uh, given what uh, Israel Hyde has said about his own personal commitment, spending his own money to create the foundation of the museum, and the very beautiful picture he had also painted about the Genesis Shiro Museum in the Pan Atlantic University, uh, we have these people who are very dedicated. And um, indeed, um, this is very reassuring because they've been collecting the works of several Nigerian artists. And for me, this is quite important because it's uh, to incise this collection within Nigeria. Uh, if we lament the case of the looted um, works that are found in museums outside of Nigeria out of reach of so many of us, uh, if we didn't have these collectors, then we might be going back again to Europe to look at our contemporary artistic expressions, which I think would be a shame. So we should be very grateful to these collectors who are doing a great job. And not just collecting the world, but also putting them in institutions for people to access. So then it means that as an Nigerian academic, you can walk into the museum and have access to these works. Um, beyond the collections themselves, there's a lot of life around them. There's also documentation. Um, you know, in Lagos, so, so many exhibitions open every week. And after two weeks, you don't see the catalogs anymore. There's no one place where you can say that this is where an institution where all the catalogs are domiciled. And you can't imagine how very difficult it is to do research on any artist in Nigeria. Um, you have to go, it's like putting together a puzzle. Or you can't say, oh, there's a library I can get a catalog. You have to go around to family and all of that to do that. But when Professor Chike and Yako mentioned uh, in the very first panel, we talked about fieldwork. You see that a lot of the information that we need to have still resides on the field. So there's a lot of work to be done. But I'd like to add my voice to uh, what uh, General Majesty has said about um, looking for support from corporate organizations and individuals. Uh, we have quite a number of initiatives in Lagos that have been done basically by private people, by people who have a passion to impact um, you, you know, the arts community in Nigeria and are forging um, connections between the international community and local community. People like this is Silva, for example, what she's doing, the amazing what she's doing in the Center for Contemporary Arts and Nikkei Arts Gallery as well. And you, you say that we don't have a national gallery. That is our national gallery. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, yes, put your arms together for me. <laughs> and, and all the other galleries, all the other initiatives, SMO, for example, is doing amazing work. And I remember somebody who coming in that they're doing exactly what the national gallery should be doing. With the Southern Council exhibition. So, these are the kind of things that give you hope for the future. Uh, we still have a lot of work to be done. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So, from my perspective, I would just say digitizing artwork, be careful about copyright issues, seek the written, preferably written consent of the artist in a form that is, you know, clearly fair bargain. Uh, I see this because um, I've seen people cost strips of it, put in um, their apps, their designs, their logos, um, screensavers. It's important that the right of the artist is paramount because it's creative work. Now, how do we see the future and how do we make this happen? A few things, and I'll just say that briefly. Um, we need to begin to take an interest in art collection. I commend you to the book uh, Jess and I have put together, Collecting Art, the handbook. Uh, but beyond that, sophisticated collectors need to begin to mentor beginners. Femi Lee Jadu, my good friend, is an advanced collector, should find young people, should seek them out, and learn, understand what collecting is all about, and His Royal Majesty and a few others. So art mentors and mentees can get together. For the artists, let us celebrate our artists. Um, Benemon, full name, or Dinigui Bennett Chukuka Dibia Wong. There's something in his name. The name means something. It's part of his faith, his religion, his belief. And so you will see when you call Chinua Achebe, the longer name that means much more. So we need to celebrate our local artists, Shonibari has come here. We need to celebrate them as, we shouldn't just let them be prophets in the UK, 
and not at home, but exhibitions offshore, but not at home. They should also be recognized locally. For the corporates, support. So we've got Stanley Kai BTC uh, pensions. Eric, the CEO, is here, and Demola, the CEO, MD of the Stanley Kai BTC Bank. Supporting it is, you know, encourages other corporates to do the same because art refines the mind and if you identify with art you help many more things actually one of the biggest uh, private wealth managers told me they support the art because they like to promote it but i asked him could it be that your target segment of your would-be wealth people love the art since rogues and robbers don't participate in art <laughs> so it's a good place to be and then for the collectors um, we set up a society for art collection. Um, this is not a forum, but we'll talk about it sometime in the future. But we need to begin to think about supporting Artex. Artex has grown so big that I'm, al I'm almost looking forward to a new venue next year. Mm -hmm. It's become significantly successful. Corporates need to endow it. Some of us need to put back to it because it's doing more than just for the trustees and doing a lot for us in bringing us together. And then last uh, but not the least, write about the art. I did prepare an 11 page paper. Jess and I always argue, but I said I'm not going to read out 11 pages. It might be, when I stop, I'll find only three people left. <laughs> but um, our very able curator, Mr. I'm going to mail it to her and she can circulate it as just an extra goodness from Artex. Thank you. Uh, just a word about uh, what's the foundation for contemporary and modern visual arts has been doing FCMEA. Um, uh, my collections are the track all in storage. So I don't have the benefit of enjoying them. Because there's so many and they are all that. So they come up with the idea of cataloging my work for me, disguise of course, and uh, of course um, you know there's an MOU in terms of uh, and so when I'm stuck at the airport and the flight has been delayed for three hours, I'm busy enjoying my cataloging. I just want to add, as, as we round off and hopefully get a few contributions from the, 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 the audience, um, when we talk about the corporates participating, we're really talking about more sustained strategic means of participating. Again, I want to call out Access Bank, who have methodically and systematically acquired uh, artworks of what we consider to be national importance. Um, the Tutu Downstairs by Ben and Mo, um, supporting initiatives like this. So we're not talking about the odd um, discussion like this, etc. but really as corporates, having a strategy to, put, to support the arts. Some of the things that we are missing um, in our society that we perhaps can consider here is maybe with the art society that um, Fabian and God founded is to, to create an art fund, as it's done in most countries where there's a formal structure with the right governance levels and corporates can feed into that structure. So again, they don't need to think about how they implement it on, on, their, on their own. Um, the other thing that people in this room can think about, as a society, we're very giving. So that I'm sure that it's not something that we do, we don't publicize it, but a lot of people here are supporting the education of others. And the, how about being a bit more directed about that support? How about supporting people to go and study history of art, study curatorial practices? Because all these works that we have, even if we have the buildings, we need the talent to manage it. We even need the buildings to, to house the, the, the beneath bronzes that you're, that you're fighting so hard to come back to. Um, and one last thing, I think all of us in this room, as many of us as can, uh, can and should, let's fight to have history back in our country. <coughs> Yeah. 
they had the uh, African exhibition and I sat for about 20 minutes in front of the Billy Bronco <coughs> and there were a number of things that got mad and I was incredibly proud of our culture but also very sad that uh, that that level of detail was sitting in a British museum and I'd never seen it in my life and it took you know, a day at the museum. And as I left the museum, feeling a bit unhappy that I had to see that, you know, so far away from home, I came across um, a quote by a Nigerian artist, and I just want to read it to the room, because I took a photo of it. It's by um, Lawrence Ajabaku, and it, it reads, I don't believe there's any place where my name is not heard, and that the work from my hand is there is enough even if I did not reach that place. And with that, I was sort of comforted because yes, we want our art home, but it also is great that so many people see the depth of our culture. And I suppose the, the, the steps to bring the art back home only make sense if we can store them in a way that they are preserved, otherwise, What's the point?
Um, your Highness. <laughs> Ms. Um, Mrs. I Dr. It's a pleasure. I would like to say that it's amazing that you're uh, immortalizing the moment so that the immortal moment will not be forgotten because memories are, you know, they're fleeting. However, if there's a space where it would always, it would be forever, then we could transcend it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time and participation. Thank you.